Welcome to English with Afreen. In this listening test, you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now, turn to section 1. Section 1. Lotus Afreen, newly arrived student, want to get some insurance for the contents of her home. She called an insurance agent to collect current information. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Tabin speaking. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some insurance for the contents of my home. Fine. When did you move into the house? A couple of weeks ago, and it's an apartment actually. I was told by the landlord that it would be a good idea to get some insurance for the furniture and other personal possessions. Fine. Well, let's get some details. What kind of apartment is it? It's a two-bedroom apartment. What floor is it on? Why do you need to know that? Because it affects the cost of the insurance. An apartment on the ground floor isn't as protected as others and there's more chance of a break-in. Really? I didn't know that. It's on the third, no, second floor. Second. And how much is the rent? It's $625 per month. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now, listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Good. And where is it located? In Biggin Street, South Hills. I see. And what things did you want to insure? Well, what do you recommend? Well, the most important things are those which you would normally find in a home. Things like the television, fridge, and so on. I see. Well, I've got a fridge and a stereo system which I've just bought from a friend. And how much did you pay for the fridge? Er, four hundred fifty dollars. Fifty or fifteen? Fifty, and the stereo system cost one thousand one hundred fifty dollars. Have you got a television? Yes, but it's very old and not worth much. Okay, well, is there anything else you want to insure? Yes, I've got a couple of watches and my CDs and books. How much do you think they're worth? The watches are worth one thousand dollars. For both of them? No, each one and, all together, the CDs and books cost me about $400. Okay, so the value of everything you want to insure is $4,000. How much will the insurance cost? Let me see, $4,000 divided by, plus 10%. Right, so this kind of insurance, er, that's private contents insurance, it comes to $185 for a 12-month period. $185. Well, that sounds pretty good. Okay, I'll take that policy. Can I arrange the policy over the phone? Sure, just let me get the details down. So that's Mrs. Lotus Afreen, that's L-O-T-U-S. And the address is? It's 16 C. Biggin Street, South Hills. Okay, 16 C. Biggin Street, South Hills. That's right, it's two words, South Hills. And your date of birth is? The 12th of November, 1985. And your contact number? Home phone number is 9972485. Right. And er, uh, you're Australian? 
No, I was born in London, although my mother is from Tasmania. Really? Whereabouts? Hobart. I see. Interesting place. Now, are you working at the moment? No, I'm a full-time student at Sydney University. Right, good. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. Section 2, you will hear a speech of the manager of a childcare service. He is talking about the facilities of the center. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon. My name's Mrs. Carter and I run the before and after school extended hours childcare service. I hope you've had a chance to have a good look around the school and talk to staff and pupils. I know that many of you are interested in using our childcare service when your child joins the school and perhaps you already know something about it. But for those that don't, I'll go through the main details now. We offer childcare for children from the ages of 4 to 11 both before and after school. I know that many parents who work find this service invaluable. You can leave your child with us safe in the knowledge that they will be extremely well cared for. We are insured to provide care for up to 70 children, although we rarely have this many attending at any one session. I think we generally expect around 50 to 60 children for the afternoon sessions, and about half that number for the breakfast sessions. Although we currently do have 70 children registered with us, not all of these attend every day. It's 10 years since we began offering an extended hours service, and we've come a long way during that time. When we first opened, we only had about 20 children attending regularly. We try to keep our costs as low as we can, and we think we provide very good value for money. For the afternoon sessions, which run from half past 3 until 6 p.m., it's 7 pounds and 20 cents. But if you prefer, you can pay for one hour only, which costs three pounds and fifty cents, or two hours, which costs five pounds and seventy cents. The cost of the childcare includes food and snacks. They'll be given breakfast in the morning, and in the afternoon, a healthy snack as soon as they finish school. At 5 p.m., children are given something more substantial, such as pasta or a casserole. Please inform us of any allergies that your child might have, and we'll make sure they're offered a suitable alternative. As you may know, the childcare service runs through the school holidays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. We offer a really varied and exciting program to keep the children entertained. We don't want them to feel as if they are still at school. It will also feel different because they'll get the chance to make new friends with children from other schools. Spaces are available for them because a lot of our term time children don't always attend during the holiday. In the past, parents have asked if children over the age of 11 are allowed to come with their younger brothers and sisters but I'm afraid we're unable to do this because of the type of insurance we have. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, listen and answer questions, 16 to 20. So now let me tell you about some of the activities that your child can do during the after-school sessions. 
as well as being able to use the playground equipment, computers, and the library, there is usually at least one special activity that children can do each day. For example, Spanish. We have a specialist teacher coming in every Thursday to give a basic introduction to the language through games and songs. She does two sessions, one for the over eight seconds and one for the younger children. This is the only activity which we have to make an extra charge for, but it's well worth it. Once a week, the children have the opportunity to do some music. We're very lucky that one of our staff is a member of a folk band. On Mondays, she teaches singing and percussion to groups of children. We do rely on parental support for this, so if any of you sing or play an instrument and would be prepared to help out at these sessions, we'd be delighted. Painting continues to be one of the most popular activities. To begin with, we weren't keen on offering this because of the extra mess involved, but children kept asking if they could do some art and so we finally gave in. Art is great for helping the children to relax after working hard at school all day. Yoga is something that we've been meaning to introduce for some time, but haven't been able to find anyone available to teach it until now, that is. So we'll see how this goes. Hopefully, children will benefit in all sorts of ways from this. Cooking is another popular activity. They make a different sort of cake, or pizza, or bread each week. Although the younger children love doing it, we found that the mess was just too much, so we've decided to restrict this to the over eight seconds, as they are better able to clean up after themselves. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between two students, Lan and Robin. They are discussing about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions, 21 to 25. That essay we have to write, the one on how children learn through the media, how are you planning to write it? Well, I've given it some thought, and I think that the best way to approach it is to divide the essay into two parts. First of all, we'd have to look at some examples of each type of media. Yes, what they are. Then we could describe how we can use each medium so that children can learn something from each one. Exactly. Maybe we could draw up a table and look at examples of each medium in turn. Mm. Uh, let's see. Um, the different forms of media would be the print media. Here you'd have things like books and newspapers, that sort of thing. Mm. And included in these are the pictorial forms of print media, like maps. Yes. Maps are really just formal pictures, aren't they? Mm. And then there are what we call the audio forms of media where children can listen. Mm -hmm. CDs and radios are probably the best examples because a lot of children have access to these, especially radios. And this would lead into the audio-visual media, mm. which can be seen as well as heard. Uh, film, television, uh, and we mustn't forget videos. Yes, but there's a final category as well. Computers mm -hmm. that make up the so-called electronic media. In the United Kingdom and Australia, they say that one in three families has a computer now. Yes, I believe it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you'll have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, uh, that's a good list to start with. We're really getting somewhere with this essay now. Hmm. 
So let's move on to when each type of medium could be used. I guess we could start by trying to identify the best situation for each type of media. What do you mean? I'm talking about whether each medium should be used with different size groups. For example, we could look at pictures and ask whether they're more useful for an individual child, a few children together, or a full class. In this case, I'd say pictures are best with individual children because they give them an opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. Yes, I see. Let's take tapes next. Although tapes look ideal for individual children, I feel they're best suited to small group work.、Mm. This way, children don't feel isolated because they can get help from their friends. Computers are the same. I think they're better with small numbers of children, and they're hardly ever useful with a whole class. Videos, however, are ideal for use with everyone present in the class, especially when children have individual activity sheets to help them focus their minds on what's in the video. And what about books? What would you recommend for them? Books are ideal for children to use by themselves.、Mm. I know they're used with groups in schools, but I wouldn't recommend it. Other pictorial media, like maps, though, are different. I'd always plan group work around those.、Mm. Give the children a chance to interact and to share ideas.、Mm, I agree. Teachers often just leave maps on the wall for children to look at when they have some free time, but kids really enjoy using them for problem solving. Yes. Different people have different ideas, I suppose. Yeah, and different teachers recommend different tools for different age groups. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on bird migration, which has been studied over many centuries through a variety of observations. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Scientists believe that a majority of the Earth's bird population migrate in some fashion or other. Some travel seasonally for relatively short distances, such as birds that move from their winter habitats in lowlands to mountain tops for the summers. Others, like the Arctic tern, travel more than twenty-five thousand miles seasonally between the northern and southern poles. Bird migration has been studied over many centuries through a variety of observations, but until relatively recently, where birds went to in the winter was considered something of a mystery. A lack of modern science and technology led to many theories. That we now recognize as error-filled and even somewhat amusing. Take hibernation theory, for example. Two thousand years ago, it was commonly believed that when birds left an area, they went underwater to hibernate in the seas and oceans. Another theory for the regular appearance and disappearance of birds was that they spent winter hidden in mud till the weather changed and food became abundant again. The theory. That some birds hibernate persisted until experiments were done on caged birds in the 1940s, which demonstrated that birds have no hibernation instinct. 
one of the earliest naturalists, and philosophers from ancient Greece was Aristotle, who was the first writer to discuss the disappearance and reappearance of some bird species at certain times of year. He developed the theory of transmutation, the seasonal change of one species into another by observing red starts and robins. He observed that in the autumn, small birds called red starts began to lose their feathers, which convinced Aristotle that they changed into robins for the winter and back into red starts in the summer. These assumptions are understandable given that this pair of species are similar in shape but are a classic example of an incorrect interpretation based on correct observations. The most bizarre theory was put forward by an English amateur scientist, Charles Morton, in the 17th century. He wrote a surprisingly well-regarded paper claiming that birds migrate to the moon and back every year. He came to this conclusion as the only logical explanation for the total disappearance of some species. One of the key moments in the development of migration theory came in 1822, when a white stork was shot in Germany. This particular stork made history because of the long spear in its neck, which incredibly had not killed it. Everyone immediately realized the spear was definitely not European. It turned out to be a spear from a tribe in Central Africa. This was a truly defining moment in the history of ornithology because it was the first evidence that storks spend their winters in sub-Saharan Africa. You can still see the arrow stork in the zoological collection of the University of Rostock in Germany. People gradually became aware that European birds moved south in autumn and north in summer, but didn't know much about it until the practice of catching birds and putting rings on their legs became established. Before this, very little information was available about the actual destinations of particular species and how they traveled there. People speculated that larger birds provided a kind of taxi service for smaller birds by carrying them on their backs. This idea came about because it seemed impossible that small birds weighing only a few grams could fly over vast oceans. This idea was supported by observations of bird behavior such as the harassment of larger birds by smaller birds. The development of bird ringing by a Danish schoolteacher Hans Christian Cornelius Mortensen made many discoveries possible. This is still common practice today and relies upon what is known as recovery. This is when ringed birds are found dead in the place they have migrated to and identified. Huge amounts of data were gathered in the early part of the 20th century and for the first time in history people understood where birds actually went to in winter. In 1931, an atlas was published showing where the most common species of European birds migrated to. More recent theories about bird migration. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.
If you score 1 to 18, you are unlikely to get an acceptable score under examination conditions, and we recommend that you spend a lot of time improving your English before you take IELTS. If you score 19 to 27, you may get an acceptable score under examination conditions, but we recommend that you think about having more practice or lessons before you take IELTS. If you score 28 to 40, you are likely to get an acceptable score under examination conditions, but remember that different institutions will find different scores acceptable. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate it.